We're really honoured at SVA to have so many um, terrific people that have um, had the sense of coming and joining with us today, the very good sense of coming and joining us today, um, but to talk about an issue uh, that we at SVA feel is a, the right progression to bring us to the next, um, the next stage, I guess, of our work. And we jumped straight into the first slide. There was a bit of opening that I was going to do with that, but here it is. We talked about it last night in terms of the national challenge, um, and that was despite an increasing investment uh, over time in the last 10 years, we have seen uh, a, a flat line or a decline in some senses in, uh, in academic and uh, educational outcome uh, against international measures. Now, that's not even to talk about some of the other bits that we discussed last night in terms of wider measures of true educational attainment and achievement as well. Um, and we do recognise and understand that these are aggregates on total outcome measures, but, and they're complex and contested. The solutions, the challenges that sit behind them and the differences that sit underneath those discussions. But what's clear is that we do need to lift in all of the forms that we were describing last night. Um, and to do that, we need to be lifting in the most efficient form possible. Because again, we had you know, a rigorous conversation last night about the impact and the importance of funding and the direction of funding. But underpinning that conversation is a recognition of scarce resource and the need to target that resource as effectively and as efficiently as possible. And we, we, you know, we talked about it briefly last night. We can consider that as a getting the best educational return on our investment. Um, but that's a very, very dry term, an educational return on investment. So we felt that the, the way to open this conversation and, and really the framing of what we're hoping to do today in terms of this begins with this really human lens. And we've got to recognise that the impact and the change doesn't happen in cohorts. It doesn't happen in regional areas or administrative sectors. It begins in the life of a child, each child. Each child, each classroom, each school. And all of our collective work is focused on making the best possible impact and improvement in the life of that child and their life chances. And the evidence shows that uh, after what the child brings with them, himself or herself into school, the biggest difference that we can make in school is in quality teaching. For those of us who've been around the sort of system reform literature and work for a little while, it's incredible to watch this global consensus start to form that at least part of the theory of action has got to involve getting evidence into educational decision making and educational practice. And in Kevin, your kind of language of if we're going to get better faster and more consistently, this is not the whole game, but gee, it's got to be part of the game. And if you look at the way, I guess, Kevin and your team are getting pulled to different parts of this country, different parts of the world, there's a huge appetite right now to get into the evidence game, isn't there? And different systems uh, represented here today, BC and Michael Full in Ontario later on, uh, England obviously, and actually across our own home jurisdictions, we're all on the journey towards trying to get evidence generation happening, evidence use happening in new and different ways. But no matter whether uh, we're new on that journey or a decade or two in, I think we'd all admit that we're still not necessarily making progress on some of the biggest blockages. You know, from a supply side, as Tony said last night, we actually need more and better evidence. It needs to be more relevant to the problems of practice as well that educators face every day. And it needs to be in usable formats that I can use in the daily conditions that I face as a school leader, as a teacher. And from a demand side, how are we ensuring that educators have the mindsets and the skill sets to effectively interpret evidence, use evidence, collect their own? And as Pete Goss always pushes, it's not just about their skills, but also the conditions under which they work. How do we ensure the conditions at the school level and the system level that these people are well resourced and it's enabling conditions to make the use of evidence the most rational choice under the conditions in which they work? And so what we're really talking about today is evidence systems, but right at the heart of an evidence system has got to be the school leader and the teacher. Because if we fill our libraries or our resources with more and more evidence, but we don't enable those core actors to apply evidence into practice, we're not going to see the results that we're looking for. And so we want to suggest that any vision of an evidence-informed system has really got to have empowered educators who are engaged in evidence, generating evidence, empowered by evidence, right at the core of the system. And so whilst there's lots of us here who might represent research or um, system leaders, Actually, this has got to be an agenda that's not just about policy and research. It's got to be an agenda that comes actually demanded by the profession. A profession who wants to use evidence to push their own standards of practice. A profession who wants to use evidence to be empowered to make a bigger impact on student learning than ever before. And so we really want to place the, the educators at the heart 
And to actually suggest as well, whilst we're talking about systems and ecosystems of evidence, it's the school where the real action happens. And it's the school leader where she has the role, where he has the role to create the conditions that enable people to use evidence in meaningful ways in the context in which they work. Making sure professional learning is evidence-based and actually helps educators come around data in meaningful ways. Making sure the use of evidence is valued at the school culture level, the shift in the conversations in the common room. And so we really believe that schools and school leaders are the locus of change in the work. And so with that clear frame, we're constructing, and I guess our contribution to today's conversation in summary format is the concept of an evidence-informed ecosystem, which is building on the work of, of many others. But the two parts to that are disciplined innovation or a process of continuous improvement that's running in schools, owned and led by school leaders and a team of uh, passionate and informed educators inside the school, generating the research questions, which is the top flow across to the right-hand side of a wider ecosystem. So their data, their challenges, their questions are one of the starting point of an evidence on the right-hand side, a wider evidence chain that works its way through producing um, both high-quality evidence and evidence that is presented back in forms that can be meaningfully used and deployed straight into practice. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just on those two sides of this ecosystem. And in terms of the, the right-hand side of that wider evidence chain, we begin at 12 o'clock with evidence production. Um, but again, we're recognising that the, the impetus or the questions to those are those that are living and are real and that could make the biggest difference into practice. Um, we recognise that there is a range of evidence uh, that people build in terms of research practice in schools, um, external sources providing validated research right the way through to RCTs that Kevin was talking about last night. But all of it needs to be high quality, high quality and well intentioned. And it needs to feed through into the next stage, which is forms of synthesis. So we know from John Hattie's work the importance of meta-analyses of large data sets that allow us to understand and draw implications, meaning from multiple disparate contexts that allow us to understand what might be replicable. Much of our work in many places stops at that point. We consider that's the end of the research work. We've now produced it, we've synthesised it, we've presented it. But this next form of transformation is incredibly important, and I guess this is part of the journey of heading towards meaningful and useful materials. It needs to be transformed. Communication needs to head to the fore. The marketers need to start saying to us, here is what this information needs to be presented as in what forms to your specific audiences. How are they best going to make use of the valuable material that you've created? And so there's real value adding that needs to happen in the transformation process. Things like, what's the cost of achieving that effect size? What are the implications for me if I was to think about doing that? And the toolkit fits strongly into this world, creating a sense of, yes, there is effect size, yes, there is impact. Now let's understand how rigorous and strong the evidence is in supporting of that, recognising that there's complexity to that conversation, and also recognising that there is a cost dimension for every decision that a school leader makes. But even that's not enough. The next stage of engagement is about recognising that the passive receipt of information is likely to have very little to no impact on educators in practice. So engagement is about creating the networks that are authentic, that are owned by educators who can speak with their own voices in a place where they feel trusted and valued. And that recognises that that needs to be a place of independence from many of their other conversations that they'll have with other actors in the system. So intermediaries trusted and valued are very important in this engagement frame. And then finally to implementation. At the end of this, it needs to be able to be used in ways in which a school leader can say, got it, I'm going to take it, let me understand what I now might do with that in my own context. Okay, so we've got this sense of a great consulting slide, if you like, of an evidence production chain and all the elements that we need. But let's surface back into the life of a school leader. Uh, imagine for me uh, a school leadership team at a high school in southwest Sydney. Uh, her name's Sue, the principal of the school. She's bringing a team together and they have a sequence of three meetings this term, term four, to get ready for their new school improvement plan. If you're a New South Wales person, there's three strategic initiatives and five Ps and milestones. They're doing the whole new process. Now, as they come together, they're big fans of the ACR framework and they say, we've got to have an explicit improvement agenda. And looking at the data at the last meeting, they are absolutely convinced they want to make progress on their most disadvantaged, struggling readers. They're a high school, but reading and literacy is the key challenge they're facing. They come together, they've got 50 minutes allocated, it's week two of term four, and of course they lose 15 minutes of that to a parent who needed to see the principal and had no appointment for that meeting. 
Now they've got 35 minutes. They come together. Her team are energized. They're generating ideas. Her deputy principal says, Sue, let's face it. The real problem is the primary school. Let's send them back down there jokingly, and then suggests, look, we've got to make progress on our completion rates. Our director's really interested in this. Why don't we put all our resources on our year 11 students who are struggling, try to get their reading up, see if we can get more of those through and get a bump in our milestones in a year from now. One of the other teachers says, just wait a minute, I got an email from this new company. They promised evidence-based out-of-the-box solutions that are guaranteed to lift reading. Let me try to find that for you. And then the last one says, she's actually the head of English in this meeting. She says, I'm sick and tired of English having to deal with literacy across. I'm convinced every teacher needs to be a teacher of literacy. Sue's sitting there thinking, you know what, you're right, but there's no way I want to have that conversation with the head of science. 35 minutes is up, they've barely made a decision. That evening at six o'clock, she's the last one out of the building again. She thinks, I'm just going to ring David, my former DP, who's now up on the northern beaches, get his sense of what he's doing. They have a great conversation. Actually, David is absolutely stoked. He's making all this progress with his low achieving readers, but they're using a program from UTS and she gets off the phone and says, is this really gonna fit with my context? You see, this is the reality of working out in your language, Kevin, how do you use evidence as a platform for professional conversations? And so as we think about this wider evidence chain, how are we gonna create the kind of relevant, useful formats of evidence that could meet a team of educators for 35 <laughs> minutes as they make a decision on what to do next? So what might be an alternative story? And SVA calls this a discipline innovation cycle. Starting off saying, we've got the impetus, we've got our driving question, how are we gonna make progress for our most disadvantaged learners? But then the next point wouldn't be, hey, what's any idea that you've seen happening in a school before, or what's an email that you got? You turn to something like a toolkit, and we have conversations together as a team with that up on the screen, and we say, what works, for whom, at what cost? And we use that as a discussion point, because the evidence doesn't tell us what to do, but it gives us a strong starting point for having this discussion about how we might make progress. I then engage with my networks, researchers, and other principals and say, have you tried this program before? What are you learning about what works, for whom, under what conditions? And together they start to make a judgment that they're gonna move and adopt towards taking one of these intervention programs. But it's not a panacea, just having an evidence-informed program, just deliver it with fidelity and we'll get the results. No, they start to say, how might we need to adapt this in our context? Hey, our timetabling is a little different to what's worked in other schools. Luckily though, we've got implementation guides, rich information from other places that have used this, not just on the what, but on the how. We start making progress, we get it into action, and then we go through rapid cycles of learning together, acting, evaluating, and learning from that, willing to adopt and change over time. Finally, with momentum, some evidence, not robust RCT evidence, but some evidence that things are working. They make a phone call after a year to UWS, University of Western Sydney, ask for some researchers to come in and around them to really validate what they're sensing is really working. Those UWS researchers do some higher quality, robust research, and that research gets put back into an evidence hub that the whole system can use as they move forward on their journey. Excellent. So you can see that the We've got a framework, an idea that we're presenting, absolutely drafting for today's discussion and, and for ongoing feedback. But that's framing our thinking as we head to, I guess, an action plan. Sense of action from us said, well, all right, if that's, if that's a, a place to think about, if that's some areas to work into, what should we do? And so our view, uh, and I guess what we're um, from the education team at SVA is saying that we feel there are three programs that we're committed to advancing in partnership with those in the room. And I guess the way that we're seeing that run under three programs for change. So the first on the top left hand side is the conditions and the capabilities to engage. So what are the things that we're doing that can advance the capacity um, and the sense of ownership and agency from education professionals to move this sort of framework into place uh, and, and have that authentically lived in their own experience. Um, the right hand side is more and better evidence. So speaking strongly to Tony Cook's point last night, you know, we recognise that we need increased investment in research of many kinds and we need to make sure that it's, it's better. It's higher quality, uh, it's more targeted, it's more relational to the impact that we could make inside schools and for educators. And then finally at the bottom underpinning this is we need meaningful access to evidence. And so that is about tools, conditions and networks that allow real people who are actually working on making the change in real lives into their daily work. And so I guess the expanded view here is some of the examples of the things that SVA feel are important under those three areas. 
Um, I guess we hope the contribution for today in terms of those three programs for change may be to allow yourselves to position your own work inside those areas. What are the things that you're working on? Maybe they're in two or three of those. Maybe they're in all three of those categories. But have a think about the work that you're doing and how it supports any one of those three programs. And then I guess additionally have a think about where are you strong or where are you weak? What are the extra work that you should be doing next in terms of your own challenge to move forward? Um, and we'd love to keep the conversation going with you about how we might assist. How do you see a role for SVA in supporting um, and being a participant with you, um, bringing assets and the capabilities that we believe we have to help you in that work? And so within that thinking, I guess we finish where we largely started, that this is a human story in a very important area of work. Um, and whilst we all have a role to play, and many of us have fundamental roles to play, they're necessary but not sufficient. And what has to happen is that we place professional educators at the heart of the work so that they in turn can make the difference into lives of children that we know that they're best placed to do. Thanks. Tony, we'll pass to you now.